This is BBC News. We'll have the headlines for you at the top of the hour, which is straight after this programme. Hello, everybody. A very warm welcome to Talking Business Weekly with me, Aaron Heselhurst. Let's go and take a look at what's on the show. The 300 billion dollar question. Should Russia's cash be taken away to pay for the war in Ukraine? With the fighting into its third year, can the West finally land the financial blow on President Putin and finally stop him from affording the war? I'm going to be discussing that with these two. There they are, an Eastern European economist who thinks selling the assets might mean less money for Ukraine in the long run. And Estonia's foreign minister tells me taxpayers, they shouldn't have to foot the bill for the aggression of his next door neighbor, Russia. Plus, what about the damage inside Ukraine? One of President Zelensky's top economic advisors tells me about the struggle to keep financing the fighting and why getting millions of Ukrainians back from abroad will be crucial for the country's future. Wherever you're joining me from around the world, once again, a big hello and a warm welcome to the show. You know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is now into its third year, costing tens of thousands of lives and billions of dollars. It's huge impact. It's been felt in economies all around the world. It's had consequences for global trade, energy and food prices. But most of all, in Ukraine itself. So, can the assets the West has frozen, and which belong to Moscow, be used to pay for the damage and Kyiv's ability to fight back? Ukraine's reconstruction bill, it's now estimated at $486 billion. And there are signs that the West's enthusiasm for providing financial support is waning. Putin does not value people's lives. He doesn't understand or respect any rules. The only thing that is important for Putin is money and power. We need a strong decision that would confiscate Russia's frozen assets, and we need further full-scale sanctions pressure on Russia in order to constrain Putin's capabilities to finance this war. And it's an idea that seems to be gaining traction, even though... It's not without its risks. But there's growing legal support for the idea that there is a way of using these resources. I think the moral argument is quite um, straightforward, which is that at the end of the day, Russia is going to have to pay reparations for its illegal invasion. So why not spend some of the money now rather than wait till the war is over? And and although the West, it hasn't been directly involved militarily, seizing assets is one more economic weapon to try and cripple Russia's financial firepower. To mark two years since President Putin's invasion, the US and EU both hit the Russian regime with hundreds of new economic sanctions, which are also linked to the suspicious death of the Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. It means that the US has now hit more than 4,000 companies and individuals, whilst the EU has targeted more than 2,000. And early in the war, more than $300 billion of Russian assets held in the West were frozen, about two-thirds in Europe, but also significant sums in the US and UK. These sanctions seem to have had a limited impact on Russia's economy. Despite an initial hit, it's been growing as President Putin has funneled resources into building a wartime economy. One reason he's been able to do that, it's oil and gas. Russia's government raked in almost $100 billion last year because its position as a leading supplier means the West doesn't want to remove from the global market altogether. But that said, the West has made efforts to limit that income, which is now largely made up of sales to China and India. And despite that resilience, Russia's parliament has been urging the government to hit back if assets are frozen. We think that we must be ready to respond immediately if the Europeans introduce such measures. The response must be efficient and painful. We have large amounts amassed in the S-type accounts, including those belonging in part to the investors from unfriendly countries. These accounts can and must be adequately taxed, which would be a retaliatory move in case Europe makes such a decision. So, should America and Europe sell the Russian assets they've frozen and give the money to Ukraine? Well, I've been speaking to one man who's been following this debate closely. He was the Wall Street Journal's Russia editor and has covered this area for both us here at the BBC and for the Swiss banking giant, Credit Suisse. 
Alexander Kalander, thanks very much for your time. And Alexander, let's start with this, because it seems obvious to many that, that Russia's war is illegal. The UN General Assembly has called it so, although Russia denies it's illegal. But we know that the Allies hold uh, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of Russian assets. Alexander, why wouldn't they just sell them and, and give the money to Ukraine? Well, this proposition looks absolutely fine from the moral point of view, and I definitely support it. It has several problems. Well, first of all, uh, the Europeans, especially the European Central Bank and the financial authorities of the European Union, are afraid of um, uh, seizing that frozen assets because they are afraid that other countries from outside of Europe and the Western globe would be extremely reluctant to invest their savings and their funds in euro and euro denominated assets and that might hit European economy. Uh, another issue is Europe is not in a state of war with Russia. So that would raise questions and might even, as some Europeans say, damage the trust in the European legal system. On top of that, there is an issue of, I would say, financial hostages. Those are the European companies who are still active in Russia. For some of them, it was a choice, but for the vast majority of the foreign companies in Russia, it's not a matter of choice. They are unable to sell their assets. If all that is nationalized, several big European companies would face bankruptcy. And then the European governments would be forced to save them, spend a huge amount of money on on bailing them out. And at the end of the day, that would damage their ability to help Ukraine. Well, America's keen on doing this, certainly more than many uh, European countries, but the assets, they're largely held in Europe, aren't they? Yes, I think that for um, a populist politician, it looks like um, a really nice uh, opportunity to sell it to his voters. Because the populist might say that, look, we've taken uh, Russian money away from Russia and gave it to Ukraine, but we are not going to give Ukraine uh, our own money. And the problem is that $300 billion, although it looks like an enormous sum of money, might not be enough in the long term. And Alexander, within Europe, there is disagreement, right? I'm just wondering, how is Europe divided on this issue? On the one side, we see the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, the Baltics and Eastern Europe, who insist on that money to be uh, taken away from Russia and given to Ukraine and spent on either reconstruction or rearmament. The problem is that the majority of Russia's frozen assets is not in those countries. And the countries which hold the majority of Russian assets, and those are uh, first and foremost Belgium, France, uh, Germany, and other West European countries, they are much more reluctant. Well, on that note, Alexander Kalander, really appreciate your time, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Aaron. OK, so is there the political will in the West to pay for Ukraine's needs with Russia's frozen asset? With many countries' budget under strain, it would save taxpayers from footing the bill. It would also be a show of support for Russia's neighbours who have the most to fear from any further aggression. So I decided to catch up with the foreign minister of Estonia. Margus Sokna, a real pleasure having you on the show. And Margus, let me start with this, because it's been two years since the war began. We've had all those Western economic sanctions placed on Russia, but it still seems to be going strong. I mean, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, says its economy is set to grow up a healthy 2.6% this year. Margus, it, it is showing remarkable resilience, isn't it? Yes, actually, we don't know exact uh, honest figures uh, what is the situation uh, with the uh, Russian economy. But what we see is that uh, Russia is able to produce uh, military equipment, uh, able to produce ammunition. And also people are not starving, it's obvious. But if we see the figures from the European Union side, so uh, we have adopted already like the 13 uh, sanction packages and approximately 
like 60% of trade has been cutting down, put under the sanctions. But of course, there are lots of circumventions and as well what we see as a bordering country. But uh, I'm not so critical about sanctions because if we see what we had, like uh, more than two years ago, there were no sanctions. And sanctions are like hitting both sides. They're hitting uh, Russia, but also they're hitting our economies. But this is a price what we need to pay right now, and uh, we pay because all our interest that uh, we harm the Russian war machine. Marcus, do you believe that all of Europe, or, or at least the EU, should should take a hit to its economies, including consumers and businesses, just to try and make it harder for, for Russia to fight this war? What we must understand that uh, to have business with Russia uh, doesn't work. It was a year's uh, European policy, some bigger countries, they were thinking that if, uh, if we have a, like uh, economical relations, strong relations with Putin and, and Russia, then we can somehow control uh, Putin. And Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, they were exactly these kind of projects. That uh, was an idea that, you know, this is not political, this is only economical. But actually it was 100% political. Everything economical from Russia is political as well. And I don't say that we must take the heat, but we just need to organize, reorganize our economies, not to be so much dependent on uh, Russian economy. Maybe that is a price what we pay now, but it, it, it doesn't work for the long run because Russia will remain a threat. There won't be a solution in the meaning that the, the, the business will continue as it was before. Well, Marcus, as we know, I'm Russia, it's one of the world's biggest oil and gas producers. And yes, sanctions have limited the amount of cash it gets for those fossil fuels. But we know it sells more and more to India and China. Last year, it raked in around $100 billion from oil and gas. Would, would a move to cut that be, be more helpful to hurting Russia's finances for this war? Of course, uh, Russia is earning lots of money uh, by gas and oil and, uh, and any, any kind of export. What we have been thinking and proposing as well as a sanctions in EU is to lower the price because it harms a lot very directly machine, uh, Russian war machine and economy. But uh, we know the global games and, and the G7 is not uh, supporting this idea right now. So it has been always uh, as well the proposal what Estonia has made, but we are a small country, we cannot uh, finally decide alone this. So it is always on the table of EU sanctions packages. And also we put this uh, proposal uh, on the table for the 14th package, what is now under consideration. Well, just on the Russian oil, I mean, there is that Western imposed price cap of 60 bucks a barrel. But what would you like to, to see it come down to? Actually, we have adopted in European Union last year uh, the, the process or the algorithm that uh, what the oil price uh, must be. Uh, it is connected to the, 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 the market price, but uh, there is a, a level of that. But the case is we are not following it. So actually from Estonian side, we are not offering anything new, but we are not following it because uh, the G7 and also the bigger countries, they are not agree with that. If you are lacking the political will, then you are not able to do it. So the procedure is there, the decision is there, but we are not uh, following that. And this is something what we are not happy about. Well, Margus, let's talk about those frozen Russian assets, mostly held in the EU, of course. Do you think Europe needs to be more aggressive in selling them to give the money to Ukraine? And I'm kind of wondering, Margus, why, why big powers like France and Germany seem to be reluctant to doing that? We have taken this leading position uh, as Estonia to talk about it and to find a way out that we can, uh, we can use them and we need it. And there are like the three reasons why we push it heavily. One, of course, is to give money to Ukraine, recovery process and support Ukraine. The second is actually to give very straightforward uh, message to uh, Putin and, and oligarchs in Russia that actually we can take the assets, we can use them and aggressor must pay. And the third is much more like cynical in the meaning that we have elections coming uh, all over the world and uh, taxpayers and voters, they are asking uh, the rightful question that how long we have to pay? Why doesn't Russia pay for the damages and also the recovery process? And that's why I see as well that we have been pushing this frozen assets question already a year. 
And I think that within the last like couple of months, there has been more political interest about what we are doing and how we are doing it. And the first sign, and it was a big move actually on EU level, when 27 countries decided that uh, actually we're going to use the profits of the frozen assets. Uh, this is a big money as well, but this is something that we achieved. Mm. But now we are pushing heavily uh, domestically in Estonian parliament the draft law. How can we use the frozen assets? And if we show the way that there is an opportunity uh, following the laws that we can use it, we can use frozen assets, uh, then there won't be a, any juridical excuse, only political will. And, Margus, let me end on this, because if sanctions and other financial weapons don't starve President Putin of the resolve and the resources to stop fighting in Ukraine, I'm wondering, how concerned are you that he could then turn to, well, your country and, and other neighbours next? We know already years that uh, Putin is a threat, Russia is a threat. And we saw it in Georgia, we saw it in Ukraine 2014, repeatedly now. Uh, and also, uh, the vocabulary has been very heavy from the Putin side. Maybe he will have a NATO test. I don't know in what scale. Uh, we don't see this military capabilities right now. But of course, Russia has a plans to increase them, to reestablish them. Now they are tied in Ukraine. And that's a, the main message as well from my side is that for us, it's the keeps the most efficient way to support Ukrainians now with weapons, with ammunition, because they are fighting instead of us. If there will be a military invasion, so we have 200 kilometers depths, strategic depths, we will win the war, but we will pay as a country, as a nation, a very high price for that. So I would like to uh, say everybody who are, who, are live, who are living in Europe and who are members of NATO that now it's a time to support Ukraine and now it's a time to invest in our independent uh, defense capabilities. So I hope that uh, there is some, uh, some, some um, rationality left uh, to Putin not to even think about uh, to attacking NATO country. Well, on that point, Margus Sokner, Estonia's foreign minister, a real pleasure having you on the show. Good luck with everything and we'll check in with you soon. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, after more than two years of fighting, Ukraine and Russia, they're both struggling to make significant progress on the battlefield, despite the thousands of lives that have been lost. Moscow seems to have money, but for Kyiv, the cost of bullets and shells, it's a growing problem. So just how is it going to keep financing the fighting, let alone pay for the repair bill? So I decided to catch up with one of President Zelensky's top economic advisers. Alexander Rodnienski, really good to see you again. And Alexander, let me start with this. I mean, two years since Russia's invasion. What does the economic picture on the ground look like today in Ukraine? So we are in a wartime economy. I say weapons are usually the best tool of economic policymaking during a wartime. And that is primarily because expectations are formed by what happens at the front line. If expectations are good, if we're having successes, that leads to investment, that leads to more confidence, better business climate, more job creation, etc. But the reverse is also true. Another example is the air defense. It's obviously, clearly to everyone, if there's no air defense, the, the enemy can bombard our facilities, our production sites, anything that we use for infrastructure, and that has, a, that has a direct effect on the economy too. Number two, we're obviously trying to stabilize the economy. Initially, inflation went up. Obviously, capital was flowing out, but our central bank did a very good job at, at managing the storm, essentially, at controlling the exchange rates. And that led actually to a decline in inflation to the point where we actually reached our pre-invasion normal peacetime inflation target, which is 5% inflation. Alexander, I want to ask you, is Ukraine turning factories from one use into another? I mean, such as fridges to, to weapons? Absolutely. That is happening to large extent. And in fact, one we have a ministry now that's directly responsible for strategic developments, in particular responsible for driving our military industrial complex, for making sure we can produce and increase the production of drones, first and foremost, uh, artillery, munitions, obviously, that's a shortage that we have, as everybody knows, et cetera, et cetera. So everything that we can try and produce ourselves, we need a lot of complicated production facilities, which takes time to build. But of course, we're trying to diversify away from the reliance 
on our Western partners, given what we see right now. Well, Alexander, two years into the war, I'm wondering how difficult is it to raise the money Ukraine continues to urgently need to, to fight the Russians? Absolutely. It's very difficult, as you can see. So right now, the main stumbling block is has to do with what's happening in the US, in Congress, and the $60 billion that we're hoping to receive. The lion's share of that would be actually for military support. And again, that has a direct effect on the economy. Unfortunately, there's a lot more political stumbling blocks in our way now, which we perhaps didn't anticipate, but that we have to cope with. And it's all about our survival. So we're not talking about reconstruction here, right? I wanna make sure everybody understands. This is really about making sure that our economy can survive and just manage this period. But I will say also that we've had some success with the EU more recently, where the 50 billion euro package was approved and passed, and we are trying to make adjustments, adapt to the economic changing environment. Part of that is increasing our facilities, our production, our military industrial complex, supporting it in terms of making sure we have the internal resources to produce ammunition, for example, if we need it. Another part of that is obviously just financial, purely financial. That means if we were not going to get certain amounts of funding, there's options on the table like increasing taxes, maybe reducing some of the spending in various areas, which is very painful, of course, because we've already cut down on a lot. We are in a wartime economy. It's not an easy time to do these sorts of things. And Alexander, on the show this week, we've also been talking about that some $300 billion of Russian assets held in Europe. And I'm assuming there's no doubt President Zelensky would love for those assets to, to be passed on to help fight the war. But I've got to ask you, why do you think some European nations are just so reluctant to sell them and hand the cash over to you? Yes, that's an important issue for us. And I think the main challenges here are political and legal in nature. We know there's around $300 billion floating around in Russian assets that are frozen and that could be used or should be used if we're looking at a fair world or some sense of justice for our reconstruction at the very least and to compensate for what Russia has done to us. But I guess the Western world, first of all, there's protection of property rights. So you can't really get around them that easily. And obviously you would be setting a precedent for other countries and that could affect uh, global globally, the financial architecture, which people are worried about. Well, just how much help would $300 billion from those assets be to, to your war effort? Well, obviously, these are immense sums. And you have to remember, they are, you know, several, they're about twice as much, uh, twice as big as our GDP annually. So they would make a di big difference if we would at least be able to get a handle on some of that. Alexander, I'm just wondering what President Zelensky and you as part of his government make of all the elections coming up this year, especially in the United States, and the fact that they, they could lead to a big change in attitude towards helping Ukraine pay for the war. Certainly that is a concern for us. And who knows what they will say when they come to power. They might change, if they come to power, they might change their views, hopefully, if that were to happen. But as I always say, we need to adapt beforehand. We need to devise plans, plan B, plan C, and that's what we're doing. Our government is working on increasing production of military equipment, shall we need it. And we're obviously concerned with Western powers being less inclined to support us going forward. Well, let's talk about the agricultural sector. We know worth billions to your economy, certainly before the war. And because of the wheat and the sunflower oil, amongst other things that you export, and we know they're so important to the rest of the world. Alexander, what sort of state is the agriculture sector in at the moment? Obviously, we've seen losses and a lot of the territories have been occupied. Those territories have also been used for agricultural production. So that is a loss for now. Hopefully we'll be able to recoup it, but who knows so far. But we've seen some good developments. And again, they have to do with the military side primarily, which is that we were able to unlock the blockade that Russia has in, imposed on us. Now, long story short, if you look at the numbers, in January 2024, we've had around 7.3 million tons of food commodities being exported. 60% of that, I think, went through the sea. So in other words, we're back to pre-war, pre-invasion levels when it comes to sea trade, almost, and grain exports from there. And Alexander, let me end on this, because one thing that all economies need to function is people. But correct me if I'm wrong with these numbers, but something like 4.9 million Ukrainians are displaced within the country. Another 5.9 million have fled to other parts of Europe. 
Is that the biggest problem, Alexander, when it comes to rebuilding? I mean, how do you get them all back? You're absolutely right that fundamentally this is a huge shock to the labor market. A lot of our workers are gone. A lot of our production and production capacity is affected through that. How will we get these people back? Well, again, it's fundamentally that we have a resolution to the war victoriously for us. Ultimately, we also need to make sure that Ukraine is not just peaceful, but also prosperous and attractive for these people. So we need to make sure really that Ukraine at that point will be clearly on its path to work towards European integration, clearly on a reform footing, structural reform footing, clearly implementing rule of law, making sure that it combats all of its illnesses, the economic illnesses that have been well known before the war and throughout. And obviously, that is also peaceful. And that will obviously, hopefully, convince a lot of our refugees that actually most opportunities that they can get or the most attractive opportunities that they have are actually to come back and participate in that recovery and reconstruction of their country. Well, on that point, Alexander Rodnienski, economic advisor to Ukraine's President Zelensky, a real pleasure, as always, having you on the show. Best of luck with everything, and we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Aaron. Well, that's it for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget, you can keep up with the latest on the global economy on the BBC News website and the smartphone app. Of course, you can also follow me on X. X me. I'll X you back. You can get me a BBC Aaron. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.